Good morning, church. Would you stand with us today? Oh, 
Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord of oh my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy day. See back there. Time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your Just as we pause for a moment in worship and recognition of you, God, and your greatness and your goodness and your mercy in our lives, Lord, there are not enough reasons that we could come up with, God, that that is not just the title of a song, that 10,000 isn't even enough, Lord, that you are constantly working on our behalf, Lord, and the things that we don't even know, but what we do know, God, is that you are good. That you are consistently working in the unseen, Lord. We love you and we thank you. and give you all the praise and glory and honor in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Travis, and I am one of the pastors here, and I want to take a, a quick moment and just share a few announcements with you. Um, now, those of you that were here last week, uh, maybe you're going to recognize some of these announcements, but chances are we weren't all maybe here or awake because it was New Year's Day, and so just bear with me. We'll go through a couple announcements. Uh, one of them... Um, want to encourage all of you to get signed up for membership class, right? If this is something that you've not gone through, uh, not completed yet, just want to let you know that next weekend begins membership week one, and then the 15th, 22nd, 29th, that's week one, two, three. And so if you want to learn a little bit more about who we are as a church, maybe even learn a little bit about how God has gifted you specifically, um, I want to encourage you to get signed up for membership that starts next week. And then also, coming up in February, uh, our student ministry, they're going to be going to winter retreats. Two different dates, uh, the weekend of February 10th, that's going to be our high school retreat, and then the weekend of February 24th is going to be our middle school retreat. And so I can say this because chances are there are not that many students in here because they're all in student ministry, but uh, we went ahead and signed my oldest son up. He's a, a seventh grader, and so that way we get the weekend off as a, a cup. No, we're not gonna, we have two other younger boys. There's no weekend off. Uh, the reason we signed our son up is honestly because I'm excited about what happens at these winter retreats, right? I'm excited that my son is going to go to uh, this retreat 
and distractions are going to be eliminated, right? He's not going to worry about his phone or all their phones or this, that, and the other. He's going to surround himself with like-minded students who are chasing after Christ as well. And I'm excited to see what God does in and through this weekend in his life. And so that's a little bit of a shameless plug to say, get your students signed up. If they're a part of student ministry, then I promise you have an email in your inbox. You know that you get those emails regularly every week. And if maybe they haven't gotten plugged in yet on on the program, there is a, um, right here in the top right, this corner tells you how to download the app. And then all this information is going to be in the app as well. So definitely get signed up for winter retreat for your student. Uh, next, I want to let you know that community groups are going to be launching at the 1st of February. And so if you are interested in hosting a community group or maybe leading a community group, maybe both, we would love that information and just be able to have a conversation with you. And so if you could fill that out on your Next Step card and then drop it in one of the boxes on your way out, that would be wonderful so we can get in touch with you. And also want to let you know that in two weeks, we're going to have signups for community groups as well as women's ministry and men's ministry that we're going to be launching in February. And so I know last week, um, John made a comment that you could be a part of all three. You cannot be a part of all three. All right. Women go to women's ministry. Men are going to go to men's ministry. And then uh, community groups will be for, for both. But really excited about what the Lord has for us in 2023. And so with that being said, we're going to start uh, Unfading Hope. We're going to continue in this series today. Yeah, we're not that kind of church, Travis. So, uh, but yeah, <laughs> great to see everybody today. Uh, welcome Back for some, as last Sunday was New Year's Day, coming after New Year's Eve, not the most conducive uh, Sunday for church attendance, So, but we had a good crew here last week, and uh, remember, if you made it last week and this week, you're, you're batting 1,000 for 2023 as far as church attendance, see how long you guys could keep that going, but uh, January for some can be somewhat of a, a bleak month, right? I mean, uh, the, the holiday warmth has been replaced by January uh, bitterness and cold, and so we had to take down the Christmas decorations, and that's always a little bit bittersweet. Uh, Advent season here at Redeemer came to an end, and I think uh, there's a little bit of sadness uh, of that with everybody. Uh, we've probably already broken some of our New Year's resolutions. Uh, the kids had to go back to school, having to catch up on holiday spending, and did I mention it's really cold outside? Uh, but, but last week, instead of doing the proverbial uh, New Year's uh, Eve message or New Year's Day message, um, you know, New Year, New View, New Year knew you, uh, we just said, hey, let's just get back into doing what we've been doing uh, since Redeemer started, and that's just preaching through uh, the Word of God. And so, so we jump back into that, uh, just allowing God's Word to fill our souls and carry us into 2023. And uh, last week, we were in two verses in First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and uh, we really looked at this concept of Jesus Christ... We, we come to him, and he is our, our living stone, right? And, and through him, we have now become living stones of the, house, the household of God. And also, we could see that Jesus Christ went before us as the great high priest. He, he went before us, and he laid down his life uh, for us as, as the once-for-all uh, perfect sacrifice. And, and now we have been reconciled uh, with holy God. And, and because of that, because of our great high priest has gone before us, now we are able to step into our life in Christ as the holy priesthood. As we look to next week, even the royal uh, priesthood. And we now offer our lives as a living sacrifice uh, to God. And this is the, the sermon in a nutshell from last week. But, but we also talked about that these uh, next three verses and these next uh, six verses from last week, uh, we're really jumping into some uh, weighty uh, material, some uh, aspects of who we really are, our identity in, in Christ. And so we, we talked about last week even being this appetizer, this appetizer with uh, this week and next week being the main course or, or even some of these mountaintops or, or peaks in First Peter. So stepping into really what what are the promises that we have? Uh, what are some of these privileges? What are some of the, the blessings and offices that we have in Christ? In Christ, And so that's really what we're going to be continuing with today. And then today specifically, we see these lines of demarcation. These, these lines of saying, you're either going to be in or you're going to be out. There's no in between here. And so this is really, these verses are very challenging to say like, 
Who are we? When, when everything's put aside, when we're just alone with the Lord, who are we in Christ? Are, are we in Christ or are we on this other side of the fence? And so that's really where we're going today. And so we're going to be in three verses in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. You go ahead and turn there if you have your Bibles. Also, we're going to be in the book of Isaiah. We, we could see all throughout 1 Peter uh, with his great wealth of knowledge of the Old Testament. He is continuing to refer back to Old Testament uh, prophecy and specifically today he references Isaiah a few times. So, so as far as Isaiah is concerned, you know, some of us are like, oh, where does the Lord want me to read in God's word today? Just show me, Lord. And, and so, no, maybe that's not how we, we do it. But if you were to take your Bible and just kind of split it in half, uh, that's going to bring you right about at the beginning of Isaiah. So uh, Proverbs, um, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and Isaiah. So if you have one of those little ribbons or a bookmark, you could turn to First Peter and then throw that little ribbon in Isaiah because we're going to be spending a little bit of time uh, there as well. So so First Peter chapter 2, verses uh, 6 through 8. And so it reads this. For it stands in Scripture... Behold, I'm lying, laying a stone in Zion, a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Pray with me. Lord, we come before you and just rejoicing and reveling in, in our salvation. Uh, Lord, allow us never to get to a place where we take it for granted. Always allow it to be uh, the fuel that, that feeds the fire uh, of our, our lives, our, our life in you, God. Always coming back to uh, the privilege that we have, the blessings that we have, the promises that are given, uh, the offices that we hold in Christ. And, and God, as we look to what that means uh, today, uh, allow us never to grow tired uh, of just leaning into more and more of you. God, we want so desperately more of this assurance, more of this security of our salvation. But Lord, this is only found through your word. It doesn't happen by osmosis, Lord. It only happens by digging deep into what you have for us today. So God, allow us to do that. Allow us to do that. Allow our faith to be strengthened as you tell us. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So Lord, uh, allow that to be our prayer today and illuminate your word as we step into it. Amen. So right away in the passage, we, we could see uh, that Peter is referencing uh, Old Testament scripture. He, he states, for it stands in scripture. So here Peter is, is citing uh, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, which he knew very well. That was written some 700 years before him penning these words, writing this epistle. And so he is saying that this indeed is the chosen cornerstone. This is prophecy fulfilled. In the first part of the, the verse today, he cites Isaiah 28. So go ahead, if you have your Bibles, you could turn there. And this is the prophet Isaiah. He, he's speaking of the Lord's judgment on the nation of Israel. And prior to our verse today at verse 16, he, he refers to this judgment as a storm of hail. Uh, destroying a tempest, uh, a whip that runs through, uh, a covenant uh, of death and an agreement with Sheol. Those are some encouraging words for 2023, right? <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church today? But he says this, that through a precious cornerstone, through this deliverer, that this covenant with death will be annulled and, and the agreement with Sheol will stand no more. The specific verse that Peter is referencing is 16, uh, where it reads this. Behold, I am the one who is laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be put in haste. So here, God has decreed a deliverer, a redeemer. And Peter is identifying this person, this individual, to be none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. In last week's 
passage, he, he states, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. And, and this week, he is almost quoting Isaiah 28, 16 verbatim in, in the letter he's writing. He, he's telling the dispersed church, the elect exiles that he's writing to. He's telling us as believers today, he's telling anyone who has picked up this book that Jesus Christ is yet again another messianic prophecy fulfilled. We could look at this and say that he is a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. This is only found in Jesus Christ. And as we lean into the depths of this passage today, we we have to answer two questions because these two words, we're going to look at these two words, they're very important as far as our faith is concerned. That's why we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, with these uh, two words. And the first one is, what is Zion? Where is Zion? And what does that mean as far as our our faith is concerned? And then uh, the next one is, uh, what is all this talk about a cornerstone? Is that just just another stone? What what is the implications behind uh, the word cornerstone? And so our first point is this, Zion is the holy city of God. Zion is the holy city of God. Now, um, it's not the place that we love to visit in southern Utah. It's not, that's not Mount Zion. That's not Zion. It's not Zion Williamson from the New Orleans uh, Pelicans either, all you basketball fans out there. Uh, it, it, is not, <laughs> it is not Zion from the Matrix either, okay? So uh, it's also not the, the, the city in which was established by the uh, the individual Enoch in the book of Enoch. That's, that's not Zion either. It's not the, the city that is moved with the LDS faith, okay? So, so Zion it can mean many different things to many different people. We could take a very deep dive into this and, and spend a lot of time, but that's not the gist of today's passage. But we are going to give a general overview as far as this word specifically, Zion, because it, it is referring to a physical location, And it could be referred to as the city of David, uh, the city of Jerusalem, or it could even be referred to as the entire nation uh, of Israel. And so currently, Mount Zion is the highest place in Jerusalem and has actually changed location uh, three times. And so there are many historical landmarks that have been uh, proposed to have taken place at the current Mount Zion, such as uh, Jesus standing before Caiaphas, uh, the, the Lord's Supper, um, where the Council of Jerusalem took place in the book of Acts. And then also there is a, a tomb uh, of King David that is memorialized there uh, currently in the city of Jerusalem. And so now many of you may be thinking, well, now, is this the place that is, uh, we hear so much about in, in regards to religious or uh, political narratives or, or conflict or contention uh, that we hear about, even as, as late as this uh, past week? And so uh, the answer to that question is, is yes and no. Is this a place that, that Jewish and uh, the nation of Israel has really come against Palestinians and Muslims? And so yes and no. And so the city of Jerusalem in of itself is the place where you always hear about this this conflict, okay? So it's, it's taking place there even, even right now. Uh, but, but this aspect as far as uh, where you hear about, it's not necessarily at Mount Zion. It's at another place called Temple Mount. And, and Temple Mount is in close proximity to uh, Mount Zion. You could see Mount Zion here on the right, and then you could see Temple Mount here on the left. And then we have a, another picture there where it flips, and there's Mount Zion right there, and then Temple Mount over there too. The right. And so you may be asking, what is all of the conflict that centers around uh, Temple Mount? Well, it's because that uh, thing you see on the right is, is uh, a Muslim mosque, okay? And so what has taken place in uh, 638 AD, a mosque was built there known as Haram al-Sharif or the Dome of the Rock. And this is where Muslims believe that Muhammad ascended into heaven. And, and so, so as you could see, this is, uh, this is also a place where uh, Muslims attend as far as uh, Mecca is concerned, one of the three places. And, and you could see that this is uh, us as Christians and, and Jews, this is the holy land. And so we, we could go back and re- recount history and just talk about even Ishmael and some of the, the crusades that have taken place all throughout history, but we wouldn't have time for that in this message. But, but just know this, that there is contention and conflict that takes place there regularly. And one of that, uh, you know, one of the reasons that that takes place is because um, you know, Muslims, they, they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Even within the temple, Haram al-Sharif, it has, you know, some uh, part of the Quran on their inscriptions and it says this, Allah is only one God. 
Allah is only one God. Far is it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. So you could see uh, how that would not, uh, you know, really speak into a good alignment with uh, Christians. And so this is why there has been centuries of, of war and strife. And like I said, we could go on for this. But as it has to do with us as believers, as it has to do with uh, how we view uh, prophetic, the prophetic implications of our faith as far as end times eschatology, it has a lot to do because a lot of the events as far as how you view end times will take place at Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem as it pertains as we could look to some books such as Daniel 8 through 12, uh, 2 Thessalonians 4, and Matthew 24 in the book of Revelation where it really talks about what is going to take place at the temple. Is the temple going to be rebuilt before Christ's second arrival, his, his second Perusia. And so this is why it is important for us as believers because much of the, the prophecy that is going to take place is supposed to be taking place right there in the city of Jerusalem at Temple Mount. And so, so back from that rabbit trail, <laughs> but from a figurative and spiritual reality for us as believers, uh, we look to Mount Zion as the holy city of God. And if you're here last week, we, we talked about the fact that, that God has a kingdom. And this is the kingdom that he will rule and reign over for all of eternity. This is heaven uh, for us as, as believers. In addition, Mount Zion is symbolically our, our mountain of grace. It, it is our mountain of redemption. Where the writer of Hebrews contrasts this with another mountain, Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is a mountain of judgment and condemnation. And so Mount Sinai is where Moses was given the Ten Commandments in Exodus 19 and 20. And the words used here to describe God, the God of Mount Sinai, are very similar to what we see in Isaiah 28. It's a, it's a blazing fire, a darkness, a gloom, a tempest, terrifying. He, he causes beasts to die and Moses to tremble with fear. The God of Mount Sinai is the God of judgment. He is the God of the law. It is a mountain of death that's based on human morality where we are judged according to our sin. But, but, Mount Zion. Mount Zion is a, a mountain of grace. It, it is a mountain of redemption. It is the mountain that Jesus Christ laid down his life that now we can be reconciled with Almighty Holy God. It is a place where there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, according to Romans 8.1. Our salvation is based on grace here. We have been given life. We have been invited into this holy kingdom. So when we see this word Zion, it should, we should have this great affinity. Because it's not just talking about our heavenly kingdom. It's not just talking about uh, where we're going to be someday. It is talking about our salvation. It, it is talking about who we are in Christ. And so this is very important when we see this word Zion. Our deliverance from Mount Sinai and our deliverance to Mount Zion. Uh, both of these being just these characteristics, these immutable characteristics of God. God is unchanging. He is a God of wrath and judgment. But he is also a God of grace and redemption. But because of what Christ did on the cross and that we have stepped into this, now we are on the other side of the equation. We are on the, uh, the side of the equation that we look at Mount Zion. We look at Zion as the source of our redemption, the source of grace. And, and that is something that we should rejoice in. So when we see this word Zion, we should, this should bring excitement because it is not only speaking of our heavenly kingdom, it is speaking of our salvation. The other noun in this passage that serves as great importance in this, um, these verses is this word cornerstone. Cornerstone. Verses uh, 6 through 7. For it stands in scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. So last week, as we know, uh, Peter introduced Jesus Christ as this living stone that we now come through. And so now we are living stones uh, of the church of, of God. 
but this word living stone means that Jesus Christ was indeed crucified. He died. He was dead. He was buried in a tomb, but three days later, he rose in victory. And and so he is no longer just a normal stone. He is a living stone that reigns over the heavens and the earth for all of eternity. He is our living stone. He is our living hope as we see at the beginning of 1 Peter. And and so to echo the words of Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 17, he states this, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and, and you are still in your sins. And so this week when referencing Isaiah, Peter is specifically identifying Jesus Christ as this prophesied cornerstone found in the book of Isaiah. And so, so let's really lean into this concept of cornerstone a little bit more. And I imagine many of us uh, know what this means. We touched on it briefly in our, our message uh, during Ecclesia. But now, maybe even when you sing the word cornerstone... Uh, It's just a little bit more meaningful after we really jump into this. The cornerstone is the chief stone of a building. It it must be flawless. It must be perfect. It's it's sought after. It's it's, uh, uh, hewn to the point where it has to be exactly what it was meant to be. Perfect. Flawless. All the vertical angles of the building, all the horizontal angles of the building have to be based on this cornerstone. It, is, it has to be strong and secure because it has to support the entire structure uh, of the building. And Peter is telling us that Jesus Christ is indeed the prophesied cornerstone. He is indeed perfect and flawless. Our entire faith falls and rests on Jesus Christ. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the founder and perfecter of our faith. Christianity, Christianity is built on Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone in which the foundation of the apostles and prophets were built upon. He, uh, upon that foundation, we as living stones, the church is built upon. But it all starts and ends. The author and finisher, the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega, it's Jesus Christ. Paul states in 1 Corinthians 3.11, For no one, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so, again, when we see these words Zion, when we see uh, this word cornerstone, it has great significance. Large implications as far as our our faith is concerned. So it's not something, that word we should just just gloss over. When we see that word reading through Scripture, we can say, oh, I got it. Zion, that's our salvation that's a heavenly kingdom that, that we are promised, that we have hope for. When, when you see this word cornerstone, Jesus Christ is the rock in which I stand on. And so this leads us to how this passage today transitions. So in verse 7, in the middle of it, it's kind of a breaking point. In, in the beginning, we, we talk about the, the promises, the privileges, the offices, uh, the, the blessings that we have in Christ. But now it shifts. Now we see a different type of rock that exists. 7 and 8 read this. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So our third point is this, for those who do not believe, for those who do not believe, Christ is a rock of offense. He's a rock of offense. So that's that's very different than being a precious cornerstone. And as we referred to earlier, the the builders of this, uh, the builders that they're referring to right now were the Jewish leaders. They, They knew Isaiah. They had maybe even memorized the entire book of Isaiah. They knew that the Redeemer was to be this rock, this cornerstone. They knew about Isaiah 28, 16. And they also knew Jesus. And they examined him. And they found him unworthy. So what did they do? They rejected him. They, they, as we talked about last week, they were thinking that The Redeemer, the Deliverer would be this triumphant king that would vanquish their foes. That that would release them from the occupation and the rule of the Roman Empire. 
they looked at Jesus Christ and said, there is no way. There is no way a mere carpenter from Nazareth can be our redeemer, can be the, the chosen precious cornerstone. So they rejected him and put him to death on the cross. He was crucified. And so for the first part of our passage today, Peter's referencing Isaiah 28, 16. But in the second part, he's referencing another verse in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 8, 14 and 15. So, yeah, <laughs> I think I skipped a little bit here. So, but that's okay. I think I skipped an entire page, folks. I mean, so that, that's good. Uh, so, <laughs> but it, it must have been really kind of what I was talking about because I, I picked right back up and it seemed to flow, flow well. So, so maybe I, I need a little bit of help rewriting my messages here. What point are we on here again? All right. So he is not a carpenter. Did we talk about Isaiah 54? I don't think we did, did we? Goodness, that is amazing. How did that happen? Well, let, let's go back to this. Let's go back to this. <laughs> that is just great. Okay, so, so we, we went to the bad before we talked about the good. So let's talk about the good a little bit, okay? Let's talk about, now this sermon is going to go way long, uh, but let's talk about the good, and then we'll skip over the bad again because that's what we want anyhow, right? We don't want to hear about the bad. But the good is this, uh, that we talked about this um, Zion being, you know, great significance and great implications, and it's split down the middle. But we could see this. We could see this, that, that some of these things as far as the good that we have is that Christ is chosen and precious to us. He is chosen and precious to us. Uh, it also says that we will not be put to shame. We will not be put to shame. And then thirdly, it says we will receive honor. So the second point says this, that whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. I didn't cover this, right? Okay, great. Okay, so 1 Peter 2, 6, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so other versions use the word confounded and, and disappointed instead of the word shame. So all of these words, they speak into this level of being deceived. Uh, they speak into this level of being duped, lost confidence, uh, desertion. And, and so there's some that have maybe uh, come out of the LDS faith. And statistics show that 80% of individuals that come out of the LDS faith, they, they don't step back into any type of faith or, or religion because they feel as if they've been duped. And, and so he, here's the thing. We're putting a lot of stock in this, our faith. We're, we're putting all of our confidence in, in this. We're, we're resting our eternity, our, our life as believers, our earthly life as followers of Jesus. We're putting all our eggs in the basket, all our chips in here to say this is what we're putting our hope and what, what it's resting on. And this is a promise that we have where it says we will not be put to shame. We will not be deceived. Our Lord is faithful and true and whoever believes in him again will not be put to shame. And we could look at the prophet Isaiah in chapter 54 for some additional affirmation where God is speaking of his faithfulness to the nation of Israel. He's speaking of his faithfulness to us as believers even when we have not been faithful. So Isaiah 54 reads this, verses 4 through 8. It says, Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood will remember no more. You will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit. Like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you. But with great compassion, I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment, I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This passage says that we will not be ashamed. We will not be confounded. We will not be disgraced. Our hope in Jesus Christ is placed in something secure, 
safe, something that is unchanging. He is a sure and steadfast anchor for our soul, a hope that enters into the holy place behind the curtain, Hebrews 6.19. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. This is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God in glory. 2 Corinthians 1.20, as the song paraphrases, all of your promises are yes and amen. All of our promises are, are all of his promises are yes and amen. Here we, we have this privilege, which is our eternal security. That we have the promise that we will not be put to shame, and we have the blessing of eternal life. Yes and amen. Praise be to God that we have been given this beautiful gift of our salvation. We will not be put to shame. Jesus Christ is who he says he is, is who the prophets and the apostles have said who he is. It is something that we could hold fast to. We will not be put to shame. We will not be um, confounded. We will not be disappointed. And, and so now let's step into really what we tried to a couple minutes ago. Just Jesus Christ being a rock of offense. He is a rock of offense. He is either chosen and precious as we talked about, he is not, uh, you know, the, the Jewish leaders were looking for this triumphant king, but they found that Jesus Christ was, was not worthy. And so we look to Isaiah 8.14 for the second part of this verse of Peter, these passages today. We see a, a totally different thing than the first part. So Isaiah 8.14 and 15, it says this. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense. No longer precious, no longer a cornerstone, something very different. And a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken, and they shall be snared and taken. So we see this double-edged sword of Jesus Christ. He's either chosen and precious, a sanctuary in the storm, or he is a rock of offense in which you are crushed upon. You see, there's no in-between. There's no neutrality. There's no ambivalence. There's nothing that says it's okay to be over here where Jesus Christ is precious and a cornerstone to us, but then it's also he's a rock of offense. It's either you're in or, or you're out. He is either your savior and cornerstone or he is your stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and your judge. 1 Peter 2.8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And many look at these two terms and would really think that they're analogous, that they mean the same thing, but they're actually progressive in nature. They build upon one another. And what do, you, what do I mean by that? Well, a stone of, of stumbling is the rock in which you, you would trip over. You would trip over a stone of stumbling. And then the rock of offense is the rock in which you are crushed upon. So Peter uses this word for stone, lithos. But that's not the same word that he uses for rock of offense. He uses the word petra. The stone which was rejected and tossed aside, aside in which they will stumble over is now a rock, a petra, in which they will be crushed against. And here's the thing. Man, this is nothing new under the sun. Movement after movement. Persecution after persecution. Martyr after martyr. False religion, false teacher, false prophet after false religion, after false teacher, after false prophet have all been crushed on the rock of offense. Just as a ship is crushed on an enemy shoreline, just as water breaks on a stone, Jesus Christ is an immovable, unchanging Petra. He's an immovable, unchanging anvil that many men, evil, wicked men, have come against with hammers, but they have all been crushed on the Petra of offense. Charles Spurgeon states this when speaking of this anvil. Their persecutions hurt themselves. 
They cannot really injure our Lord. The hammer said, I will break the anvil. And the anvil did not answer, but abode in its place. While the hammer smote it day after day, month after month, year after year, and the anvil patiently received the blows. But after a while, the hammer broke. And though it did not say so, for it was too quiet to speak, the anvil might have said, I have broken hundreds of hammers before, and I will break hundreds more by my patient endurance. It is so with Christ and his church and his gospel. The persecutor may smite and smite and smite, and the true Christian makes no reply, but patiently bears, and in the long run, that patient endurance will break the persecutor down, as it is with Christ. What does Jesus himself say in Luke 20, 18? After he quotes Isaiah 28, 16, he says this. Everyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus Christ, his church, our faith has stood the test of time and will continue to stand the test of time all the way until eternity. We will not be put to shame. He is the anvil that breaks hammer after hammer after hammer. He is the rock of offense that will crush those who do not believe. And as we look at the conclusion of our passage today, who are those who do not believe? 1 Peter 2.8, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. What are they disobedient to? Well, the gospel. They have heard the good news. They have heard the gospel. They have heard the euangelion, and still they reject it. They have seen Jesus Christ. They have witnessed his glories. They have heard the preaching and teaching. They have heard the fact that we are sinners in need of grace, and still they reject it. Their penalty is doom, and because of their unbelief, it brings us to our final point. Is Christ a rock of offense, or is he the rock of your salvation? And that's the title of our message today. Really, it just comes down to this. Are you in or are you out? Because there's there's no in-between. The passage states that there are those who believe and those who do not believe. The passage states that Christ is either precious to you, he he is your cornerstone, or he is a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. There are those who are obedient and those who are disobedient. And, And next week it says that there are those who have been delivered out of the darkness and those who have been delivered into the marvelous light. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means there are no great Christians. There's no lukewarm Christians. We can't just stay in the middle. We can't just, you know, step our feet in and say, go, go hang out in the shallow water. We're either in or we're out. This is what this passage has to say for us today. It's not the, the easiest, most palatable, uh, you know, chunk of scripture. But this is what we're, we're seeing today. And I believe that, you know, here at Redeemer, there are, Many of us that we are very secure in our our salvation. We could look back, and I I could look back and remember the time, the moment, that day when Jesus Christ revealed himself in all of his glory, and I was delivered out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. We could look back to instances in our life where we know that the hand of God was so prevalent in our lives that it caused us to change and continues to allow us to step into a change, a life of sanctification. That's assurance. That's security in our faith. We could see and feel the fight that takes place, the conviction of the Holy Spirit when it comes to fighting sin in our life, that vigilance that we carry. We know that there are things in our life that we need to say yes to in Christ and and no to as far as our sin is concerned. We understand what it means to regularly step into confession and and repentance, knowing and recognizing that, that John says that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
We know and understand the importance of what it means to step into community. We, we can't be lone rangers. That, that is not a life in Christ. We understand what it no, means to, to serve in, in the church and to serve in the kingdom of God because we look at Jesus Christ as a model that he came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, James tells us if you love one another, if you love your brother and sister, that you are doing well. And Christian, there are many of us that we are doing well. But still, I know that there are many of us that struggle. I know because I struggle. I'm not I'm on the exact same playing field as everybody, and I still struggle with the pulls of this world. I still struggle with apathy. I still struggle with passivity. These are things that, that aren't to be a life in Christ. You know, when we look at this these two words, there's this epidemic of passivity. There's this epidemic of apathy that exists not only in our own lives in Christ, but but the church as a whole. And what is the the opposite of those two words? We see words such as fervency. We see words such as intensity, zealous, passionate. And so the question is, what of those words would be used to describe our lives in Christ? Would it be the, the former or the latter? Is Jesus Christ, is the rock precious to you? Is he precious? Do we regularly just step into what has been done? What Jesus Christ did uh, to give us the greatest gift imaginable? That, that one day we're going to be in eternity? Thanks be to God. We can't be so ho-hum about our faith. We need to allow Jesus Christ to be the cornerstone. We need to allow him to be the epicenter of our lives. We need to allow him to be everything. Everything. Not not just a little bit of Jesus on top. Jesus Christ needs to be everything in our lives. I didn't grow up skiing. I grew up in the Midwest. And the ski hills in the Midwest, they're like kind of bunny hills out here. And so I was also the youngest of six. And so we just, skiing wasn't a thing. So I took up skiing a few years ago. I'm trying to get a little better at it. You know, I'm not right at the black diamonds yet, but I could do some, you know, hefty blues. But here's the thing. I think all of us have been at a point in our lives at the top of a ski hill. Looking down, you're saying, what did I just get myself into? And and we look at that and we're saying, "I, I don't know if I'm, going to do that or not and then in my case my boys are already halfway down the hill and or my friend's like hey man we're going to do this and I said I don't know and he says well let's go let's go I mean let's go church and for 2023 and I don't know what it means in your life you know, we're all at this point where we're at the top of the ski hill or we're at the bottom of a mountain looking that we've got to climb this thing what's it going to be and may this be our attitude Because we're a church plant. (laughs) And church planting isn't for wimps. So where are we going to step into in our lives when it comes to this? Is Jesus Christ the precious cornerstone that everything else comes out of? Or is he a stumbling stone? Is he a, a rock of offense? And we have to answer this question. Is Jesus Christ worth it to you? Is he your everything? No more great Christians. No more apathy, no more passivity, no, no more one foot in and one foot I'm not so sure. Let's live our life in a way, in a manner, in fashion that is worthy of the life by which we have been called. What does it mean, what does it look like to step into some of those things in our own life? We have to contend, we have to wrestle with that. We can't just go on the rest of our Christian life just being like, oh yeah, it's good. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think things are good. No. Like the Lord has so much more for us. And if we just really contend with that on a regular basis, what is it that God's calling me to do? Allow our lives to be marked by so many things, but always allow our lives to be marked by our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us. Pray with me.
Lord, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I had this passage today. It wasn't the easiest passage. It's a very challenging passage. Lord, we just pray that our life in, in Christ, we would just regularly recognize who you are and what you've done. That uh, allow us to move away from maybe some of the passivity, maybe so some of the ho-hum attitude when it comes to who we are in Christ. And, and Lord, whatever that means in our lives, maybe it's saying yes to some certain things and no to some cer- certain things. Maybe it's just striving after you, Lord, in a way that maybe we never have stepped into in our lives. Maybe 2023 will be that year where we started getting serious about our faith. There was no ambivalence as far as being in or out. I'm all in. God, may we just regularly contend with that. Because, Lord, you are worth it. You are worth all of our praise. You are worth all of the glory. You are worth our lives being laid down as a living sacrifice because of what you did on the cross. God, help us never to forget that. Allow your death, your resurrection, your life to be the fuel that fans the flame in our life in Christ. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing this last song.
Thanks, Texan. Well, I just wanted to encourage you guys to just exit in a spirit of worship and just allow his grace to flow on you and flow through you in your lives. And uh, make sure to talk some here.